Job chapter 1, starting at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. And Satan answered, the Lord said, does Job fear God for no reason? <laughs> Have you not put a hedge around him and his, side, and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there, were, uh, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came uh, a messenger, Job, and said, The oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them, took them, and struck them down, the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another who said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, yet another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck them down, the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck down the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people, and they are all dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Wells Branch Community Church. Uh, we are in a new series called Explore God. And this is one of those you're like, all right, I didn't realize we're going to you know, talk about suffering the weekend after Easter. But here we are. Uh, the good news is that you know that if you are not currently suffering right now, you just were. Or you're just about to be. So this is great prep. Uh, and, and, and if nothing else, uh, you can help somebody else who's probably struggling right in this church right now. Uh, I've, uh, throughout my life, I've gotten to experience suffering personally, as we all have, but really probably as a pastor, uh, you get to see it firsthand. But when I was a company commander in combat, um, I saw it really up close and personal. In fact, one night, one of my soldiers just came in uh, to my office, not knocking, just kind of threw open the door and was like, sir, um, we just lost my best friend, Sergeant Gibbs, and I don't understand what's going on. And he was an atheist. He and I had, had like a lot of banter, Jesus, not Jesus talk. And, and this time he wasn't looking for that. And he's just like, why is this happening? He came to me with a genuine question. Why are we here? And he was talking about war and like, why? But in reality, the question is, let's just take war. Why is there cancer? Why, uh, are, do babies die? Why uh, do children get hurt or harmed or abducted? Why is there war? I mean, you can kind of go broaden it across the whole scope. We've all sat and asked the question, why? And so uh, this morning, we're going to answer that question as Christians. Because I know that you guys uh, have experienced hurt. And if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, this is... It, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. We, we all both experience pain and sorrow. And so I want to kind of introduce you to the book of Job. And we're going to survey the entire book. We're going to go 1 through 42 in about 30 minutes. So uh, pray for me. Uh, and uh, I just want to kind of introduce you to some of the characters. First, you got Job. Job's the protagonist. Then you got Job's wife. We don't like Job's wife. You're going to see why that was not a good pick for him. Uh, we, we've got Job's three buddies. He went to high school with them, and they are not helpful. We're going to find out about them. Uh, they are uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Uh, and they are 
just the, the friends that you really wish you didn't have. And then you got Elihu, who is uh, a younger buddy who comes in and gives some insight. And he's actually the most godly of them all. And then you've got God who speaks. So if you're wondering about the who seven characters in this one story are, that's who they are. And we're going to start with Job chapter two this morning. So if you have a Bible or you don't have a Bible, there should be a black hardback one somewhere in the row in front of you underneath the chair. Take ours. That's our gift to you. Uh, And I want you to follow along with me as we look at Job and we're going to see how everybody responds to that first bit that I just shared with you about the suffering that he experienced. And so that's where we're going to we're going to go. So would you mind praying with me, asking God to bless uh, the proclamation and preaching of his word. Father, thank you for your word. I, I love you and I know that you love us and my love for you is fickle and yours never is. And so Lord, whenever the questioning of our hearts sort of rises up and we feel pain and sorrow and we don't understand, would you allow this text to answer that question? And would our hearts be settled and rested in you? We love you, Jesus. It's all for your glory, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, so we're in Job 2. Look at verse 9. And this is Job's wife's response to Job's unbelievable pain. She's lost her own children and her husband now has got boils and sores all over him. He's sitting in a dust heap in the middle of the city dump and he's just like scraping sores off uh, off his wounds, all right? Even the dogs are like, nah, that's too nasty, right? Like that's where we're at. So then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. To which, all right, hold on. This is exactly what Satan wanted. I'm not saying she is Satan, but she's close. If you've ever felt like you were married to Satan, just check. Did they say curse God and die? No, then they might not be Satan. Okay, like that's, that's gonna be your first clue. All right, so here it is. So curse God and die. He, she's like, she's getting, she's trying to prompt him to do the very thing that Satan's whole goal was. And so she's like right out of the, like, just do the thing that Satan wanted and then die and get this thing over with. But he said to her, and you just listen, this is marriage counseling 101. Watch, watch his response. He just got curse God and die from his wife. He didn't get, oh, I'm so sorry. This must be so hard for you. Oh, man. And now, granted, she's grieving. So let's, let's give her a little bit of credit here. She's grieving. Uh, but it's sometimes, I don't know if this happens at your house. Um, men, do you, whenever you get sick, does your wife get mad at you? Like, the, like, like, how dare you? Like, I, so I was like, Job, I, I see you, man, I see you. But then the response of Job was amazing, okay? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Not that you're a foolish woman, of course, but I've seen them somewhere. They're, they're out there, I'm sure. And I've seen, and you're sounding like them. It, I would have been a lot more like anger. Okay, that would have not, that would not, that would have been an argument right there. That would have not been good. All right, so you just give Job a lot of credit for, his generous love for his wife. He definitely is a far superior human. All right, now watch. Shall receive good from God and not receive evil. And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Okay. Now, Job's wife blamed God. And let's, again, she just lost 10 kids. That's a beating. All right, let's just give her a little bit of the credit. Uh, She lost 10 kids. She birthed them. She was excited for them. They were finally, you know, they're all out of the house by now. She was like so excited about the vacation she was going to take after uh, 10 children, which I I don't know how many years that is. That's like just 20 years of, that's a lot of years, right? Like that's, that's, that's a 25, 30 years of child raising right there. You're like, you're just like fried. And you're like, I am out. And so she's ready to move on. And now they have to start all over in a dumpster and it's not going well. But so what happens is she turns to fatalism. She's like, it is over. It is over and God is at fault. And this is kind of the the mindset some people have is like, God, we know you're all powerful, but you're evil. Because have you looked around at my life, those people's lives, just turn on the TV, listen to the radio, pick a podcast. You are going to find pain just about everywhere. And if God, you are so powerful, then do something. And if you are that powerful, you must be bad. If you're not, I feel like a lot of us sort of run around like we're Lieutenant Dan. Run, 
Lord. <laughs> like there's this part of us that whenever the bad things are happening, we are ready for the storm and we've got the finger up at God going like, I am so mad. I am cursing you to your face. Not knowing, not knowing that God is in control. And even for Lieutenant Dan, and this is, the, you know, you make up a story, you can make it end however you want, right? And so he, oh, it's a beautiful ending. And there's this part of us that looks at like movies or like, that only happens in the movies. Lieutenant Dan marries a sweet Vietnamese lady and all of his conscience restored, all the shame is gone. He finally makes it right with God and God blesses him with a shrimp boat captain thing. I mean, that's not a bad deal. No legs to, to being homeless. To, and that's a good story. And that's why you watch Forrest Gump. But what if it was even worse than that? One of my favorite Christian evangelists is a guy named Nick Vujicic, which is his name is hard enough to speak, but, but when you meet him, and I've met him, I met him in Dallas about 10, 15 years ago. No arms, no legs. That's how he was born. Everyone said, you need to abort this kid. You need to get rid of this kid. This kid's not, I mean, like, what's the quality of life gonna be like for someone with no arms and no legs? Like that, God, why would you allow this to happen? Why would you allow someone to go through this much? And then all of a sudden you realize this guy has had led more people to Christ than I ever would hope to. And he's got a family of four kids. So when you look at something like that, you're like, what in the world? How can God, what is God doing? He's all powerful. If he's all powerful, that means he can take your worst situation. No, no, and, and listen, you're not Job. You're not even close. You live, first off, you're here in America. It is pretty good. So, uh, and most of you here have all your limbs. All right, and so life right here is pretty good. And so what I want you to see is that when we start cursing God and saying, you don't know what you're doing and your power isn't used for good, you gotta go, or is it? Or is it? And so that's sort of the fatalist approach. Now, uh, we're gonna take a look at, at the, the friends. Uh, you got Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, or you know, Eli, Bill, and Zoph. Uh, these guys are, you know, they, they love Job, but they're also, I don't, I'm not gonna say they're jealous of Job. These guys are good friends. They come and they sit with Job for two whole weeks in the ashes at the dump. So I, I give these guys credit. However, their response to Job is probably something that um, someone who's been in church a long time but doesn't understand the gospel would say. Okay, watch this. Because Job says, I did nothing wrong. I am, my heart is broken. Why? Uh, this is happening. Here's all I did. I, I, sh I sheltered the poor. I paid my people on time. I never wronged anybody. I always did the right thing. I've offering sacrifices just in case my kids sin because I want to make sure I covered for them. And then they, Bill speaks up. Bill's not having it. He's like, listen, buddy, how long will you say these things? And the words of your mouth be a great wind. This is where windbag comes from, right? Like you are just a windbag. Did you know that this is the oldest book in the Bible and some part of language just translates over this millennia, really? It's pretty awesome. And then he's gonna say something like this. Does God pervert justice? No, of course not. Or does the Almighty pervert the right? And in other words, he's saying something like, you are getting what you deserve, but he doesn't say it like outright. He goes to his kids, because everyone knows kids mess things up. And he goes, if your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgression. Okay. These are some great friends. And you know, you, have, uh, you got some critical friends in your life. They, they like to remind you how they did it the right way and you didn't. And your child raising led your children to be like, well, your kids, they didn't quite make it. And this is such as like, where there's smoke, there's fire. You must have done something wrong. Okay, or they did. That's why all your kids are dead. Now this, I mean, there is nothing. This is the, I call it the, I call it moralism. Um, and what it is, is like where there's smoke, there's fire. If you are feeling pain, it's because of something you did. It's kind of like 
Why is it raining? It's God's crying. It's probably because of something you did. That's kind of how moralists would sort of view the world. And so it goes like this. It goes like this. Remember John 9. John 9 is where Jesus and his disciples are um, walking along and they come up, 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 up upon a person born blind. And the disciples are, who are at that point, they'd been with Jesus for a while and I'm sure they'd read the book of Job, but their view was like clearly to be blind, so you must have done something. I mean, this is how moral people look at it. Watch. And so he goes, so whose sin was it? Was this guy's sin or was his parents' sin that this kid or this man was born blind? And Jesus responds to that, it's like neither. Now, the reason why the world is messed up is because of sin from back in the day when Adam and Eve you know, ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once you ate from that, that wrecked all of creation. But specifically, whose sin caused this person to be blind? Neither. But so that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's why. And so sometimes it doesn't work where there's smoke, there's fire. If you're blind, it's not because God is judging you. If you're blind, it's because God wants to use you. You hear that? So I don't know like where you're at and you're like, I'm feeling like I must've done something to deserve this marriage, this singleness, this job, this, you name the whatever thing and you're feeling that weight. And I wanna take the shame off you for a second. It might be because God has something bigger planned. If you will seek God and plead with the almighty for mercy, Bill says, if you are pure and upright, Surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. In other words, once you start doing the right things, you'll get what you want. In other words, we're going to talk about this, but it's like all you got to do is just pull the lever, make the right decision, follow the plan, and you'll get what you want. It's a lot of, it's as, and again, it makes God out to be sleeping. I mean, no, this is, and I'm not saying, listen, if you sort of have this view, like I've got to do a certain amount of things. I got to be, in fact, a lot of you came to church or maybe you haven't come to church a long time and you finally feel like you're good enough. And so now you showed up because you haven't sinned in a while. Like I, if you have that thought process, that's a moralist process. You're like, well, now God has to bless me. And so now because of my good works, because of my good things, I'm going to rock. God, wake up. Come on, get up. Time to do your thing. I know you're sleepy. Time to restore some stuff to me. And that's not how God works. And though your beginning was small, your latter days will be very great. So watch this. Job's friends blame Job. And you can appreciate this. I mean, you look at it, you look at his life. He must have done something. But the problem with the moralistic viewpoint of life, it puts people at the center. In other words, I pull the lever, God has to act. I give money to the church, God must act on my behalf. I serve in children's ministry, two services on Easter. And so God has to bless me. I, um, I, you know, I fed the homeless. I gave the guy my sandwich uh, under the bridge. God Okay, like now we can kind of get back on the right terms. I think that's where a lot of us go in our darkness, okay? Now, it, it creates this sort of formulaic d design where you are now in control of God. Just pull the lever. So in this, honestly, it's karma. It's karma. Because what it does, because do you know the Bible believes in if you, you reap what you sow? Like that's a basic biblical principle. That's not like you, you get what you give for the most part. However, when you take it with a karma experience, you're tapping into the universe, which is impersonal. Impersonal. Here's why that's a problem. It creates it where if it's the universe or if it's, you know, some force, like we're going Star Wars, you can use it for good or for evil. You're going to be Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader. Either way, it could go either way. You just lean into the force and you're going to get, because of your, you know, spiritual consciousness, you're going to get it to do for you what you want. Moralists make great neighbors. In fact, they are usually the president of the HOA. They're all about letting you know when, um, if for, hypothetically, I might have a basketball hoop that sometimes is in the street 
And that got a letter and then I moved it onto the, like the sidewalk, non-sidewalk area in between the sidewalk and the road and I got another letter and then I had to go up and look through the uh, rules and they didn't say exactly there so I'm fine, at least I think, and they've stopped bothering me for the most part. But I still get letters from the HOA. There's somebody who's very angry about that, right? And they make great neighbors that keep roads clean and God love them, but they make terrible friends because they're critical, because they're people who are looking to remind you how if you just do it the way that they've been doing it, you would understand how it's supposed to be and your life could be as great as theirs too, but they're white knuckling life. They're terrified of being people finding out who they really are and that is exhausting. Um, okay, here's a great quote for my, my moralist friends. All right, and it comes from Ben Franklin, who, not a Christian, but, he wrote a really funny book, uh, Poor Richard's Almanac. It was kind of like one of those that came out quarterly or whatever. And uh, in it is, is a famous quote that you may have said before. I think it was from the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. And it's this quote that I feel like this is the, now we are too smart to say this quote. We make fun of this quote enough that you probably, if you've been here for any amount of time, you haven't said this because we mock those people openly. Now, but what you may have done what you may have done is you may have said or criticized someone else's, the way they were doing something, although it wasn't sin, but it wasn't wise. And you were like, well, and you're kind of wanting to let them know. And you're not praying for them. And you're not uh, looking out after them. You are sort of waiting for them to fall so that you can be right. Isn't that fun? Isn't it so fun to be right and be like, told you. You see, I think there, that's the part that Job's friends were missing. They loved being right and they monologued him. Like, I mean, it was like parenting one-on-one monologue style. If you want to punish your kid, you pull out the monologue. I, Dad, are we done yet? No, we're not. I have another 10 minutes straight of monologuing. That is going to be the punishment for the last thing that you did. And that, that's what's going on. They're punishing Job through monologue and they're going to make sure and it makes them feel better and it makes Job feel worse. Mission accomplished. That's what happens when you are a moralist. The monologue in you comes out and you parent people. And if you don't parent them directly, you parent them indirectly through gossip. That's just how we roll, okay? And what's sort of being missed in all this is that what, what I think what God would desire for them is them to be on their face before the Lord pleading for Job. That, that's the right response. If you're wondering, if I have a friend suffering, what's the right response? Get on your face. Plead for God. Um, they know that their situation is awful and uh, let the Lord deal with their sin unless there's like something that's abundantly clear. They're, they're just throwing darts. It's like you gotta have done something wrong because this doesn't happen to good people. All right, now, verse, all right, so then next you're gonna have Job. He's gonna, he's gonna make a defense and because when you stack up the reasons why you're such a evil person and you're like, but I'm really not, you're gonna defend yourself. And Job does. He's gonna explain all the things he's done right. I mean, he's been a pure dude. He's like, listen, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? I mean, like literally, I'm like, I'm not gonna look. I, and I haven't looked, I don't do that. What would be my portion from God and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Is not calamity for the unrighteous and disasters for the workers of iniqui iniquity? Which you might be going like, whoa, whoa. It sounds like Job's a little bit of a moralist. Yes, he is. In fact, he's looking as like, I'm so good, I should be blessed. Now watch, does not he see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let God know my integrity. In other words, listen, I'm ready to be, like, take a look at my life, to look at my books, see if I cooked them, see my whole life. You're gonna see I am innocent. I don't deserve this. That's moralism again. If my step has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes. And if any spot has stuck to my hand, like any spot, like, you know, kind of like Macbeth, out damn spot. Like that's kind of where you're going. Then let me sow and another eat and let what grows for me be rooted out. You can then take, you, you reap what you sow. And if I haven't reaped prop, or if I haven't sown properly, I shouldn't reap. Someone else should be getting it. 
So he's saying like, listen, I'm ready to be held accountable to my own standards. If my heart had been enticed toward a woman, I have lain in wait at my neighbor's door. We're about to get personal, really personal. Then <clears throat> let my wife grind for another and let others bow down on her. That's exactly what you think it means. Okay, keep moving. For that would be a heinous crime. That would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges. For that would be as fire that consumes as far as a bad, and it would burn to the root all my increase. And then he's gonna move from being a moralist to someone who's like, maybe God doesn't know what's going on. He's not omniscient. Oh, that I had someone to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written, indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would say, hey, guilty, but I'm not. I would give him an account of all my steps because he doesn't know. Like a prince, I would approach him. If my land has cried out against me and its furrows have wept together, if I've eaten its yield without payment and made its owners breathe their last, let thorns grow instead of wheat and foul weeds instead of barley. In other words, here it is. The reason why all this is happening is because God doesn't know. Job blamed God's ignorance for his suffering. Now, like I've said, Job was a moralist and he's gonna shift from seeing God as an impersonal force to God as a person when he meets him personally. But at this moment, he's just frustrated because it's not working. I'm pulling the levers. I'm doing the things. When you, you can demand, watch this. You can demand things of an impersonal God or a force. You can tell it to do stuff and that's completely Okay. But the second that that God has personality and all of a sudden the set, that God is actual king and a person, then it makes you in charge of it. And the problem with the universe being God, here's the problem with that. Everyone has access to the same universe. And if we pray, pray opposite things, it has to say yes to both of us. We've all been doing the same thing. It's wild. There's so, the world is way more complex than some universal force that we can all tap into. It's way more complex than that. You're more complex than that. This life is more complex than that. And so either it's, there is no force or it is a God and you in your limited understanding, your limited years on this life can think to tell God how to run things. In fact, that's what, that's what Job does. He, he's, our, God, show up. Like I am ready to argue my case and what's wild, like this is where, I mean, I think a lot of us have been in suffering moments and you have cried out to God, have you not? I mean, you, you had the thing happen and you're like, God, how can this happen? And like you're one, and he didn't show up. That's because you weren't Job. You didn't have 10 kids get their, you know, die in a weird house flattening. You didn't have all your stuff stolen. You weren't covered with boils. I, I don't know if that's the requirement for God to speak to you audibly, but that was it for Job. <laughs> kind of honestly, I'm kind of good with that. That, that works for me. But watch how the Lord responds to Job. Job is begging for God to talk to him and he finally does. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, dress for action like a man? I will question you and you make it known to me. And I love that. No, no, you don't ask me questions. I ask you questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it on what or its bases sunk? And then for the next several verses, God goes over like the Leviathan. He goes over like how high the sky is. He goes over how deep the waters are. He goes over how, the, how plants work. Tell me about how you created photosynthesis. Tell me about that, Job. Like he got, he's taking them through it. And then... And then what I love, Job goes, I get it. I don't understand. And then God's not done. He, he kind of gets it up for again. He's like, then the Lord, look at this. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Dress for action like a man. I will question you and make it known to me. Look at this, look at this verse. He says the same thing again, but then he shifts. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? This part for me is power. Because one day, 
God will do exactly that. He, Jesus, will be condemned so that we would be made in the right. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him to become sin who knew no sin so that we might be the righteousness of God. Here's just a small, like, just a kind of proto-evangelion, like a, just a pre-gospel moment where you're seeing just like a shadow of like, that's the reality. For you to be righteous, you must condemn the Son of God. And so here it is. God reminded Job of his ignorance. Now, if you are not ignorant, it's not suffering. Watch this. Here's how I know it. Here's how I know it. Um, uh, I'm going to try and lose 10 pounds because it's the new year still. All right. And in that process, I have like the before weight and then I have the after weight. And in between is what? Suffering. Like there is a point at which because there is a goal that you are seeking to achieve, then it's, it's like purposed suffering. And so when it's clear that you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith. It's just by that point, science. It's just simply like calories in, calories out, exercise, calories in, calories, that's it. Like that, if you wanna lose weight, it's calories in, calories out. That's the magic. That's like the magic of it. So that's, it, there, then all the faith is removed, right? It's gone. There, it's like, if you eat less, you'll weigh less. That is, matter of fact, happens 100% of the time. You cannot defeat that. Okay. It's just really hard to do. <laughs> it's going to happen. Okay. So, so that, that's why you, to suffer, you have to be ignorant. Because if you were to knew the reason, or if you were to know the reason why you were suffering, then it wouldn't take faith. It wouldn't take faith. There'd be no faith involved because you would understand the why. Because that's what you're really asking. Why? When? That might be even better. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll listen, anybody can suffer for two weeks. Anybody can suffer. Okay, I'll give you, depends on the kind of suffering, but like, you know, I'll take some, I'll get tased for at least a minute if it gets something really awesome. Like, there's like a, the police were going to do like, hey, we're going to tase you today and the winner gets 10,000. I'm up, I'm, I'm in. 50 bucks, maybe not, right? Like everything's got a price. Every, everybody's got a price. And that's kind of the problem. When you come with suffering, it comes with what's the price you're willing to pay for the thing. That's it, every time. When you don't know, you are required to, to believe. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. That's it. That's it, that's it. When, when you know that, it requires faith. It requires trust. Okay. Another fun verse for you, Romans 8, 28. And I just love this. All things, everyone say all things. All things. Work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you are a Christian, there is never pointless suffering. Never. Never ever, ever. It is never pointless. If you are a follower of Jesus, your suffering is never pointless. And I think somebody needs to hear that. Listen, here's, here, can I just tell you, like in suffering world and pastor world, what's that look like? Um, several years ago, we, we were like, man, we are ready to move. We got sort of told we were the college kids in the basement in the rec center, not far from here. And they're like, it's time for you to go. Um, we love you and all, but move out. And we're like, cool. And so we came over here and I don't know if you guys remember this, um, but this used to be our space. And maybe you're not, you're like, is that like a photo op thing? Like a, a Photoshop thing? No, the, the Live for Mar More Center didn't used to be past the bar. You didn't even know that there was a bar here on Sundays. Uh, we had the children's ministry was over here and you enter here, you go across this really sweet, cool courtyard. It was shaded, it was awesome. And then you go up the stairs and then you go worship here. That's the way it was done. It was, it looked really cool. It was awesome. And then, um, I'll never forget this. Adrian and I, it was, you know, the first several years of, of pastoring are difficult. And when you add children on top of that, it makes them extra difficult. And Titus and Austin and Jed at that time were, um, God bless them, really great kids. Uh, but we were wore out, right? And so um, on the day that we found out, like Adrian took the pregnancy test, uh, like, hooray. Oh, and we said, I'll never forget this. 
now that we're in the building, it's going to be way easier. I'll never forget it. And, and that's why we can have a kid. Hooray. Same day. Pregnancy test positive. Same day. I think Jessica waited till after the service. She was so sweet to me. She didn't want me to be depressed preaching. Uh, she gives me the letter. It says, uh, this is a notice. You have to be out of this side because we are demolishing it. And I was like, no, oh, are you kidding me? No, I like it was supposed to be easy. And then, and then they, they put a CVS. So where we used to tell p- kids about Jesus or selling deodorant, it was just weird. It's so confusing. What I didn't know, here's the thing. I was ignorant. Here's what I didn't know. I didn't know that there was something happening in the cosmic forces that that God was using. Satan would say, listen, if you take away the building, I don't know if this is what Satan said. I don't know. If you put a CVS there, uh, they're going to quit. If you put a CVS there, they're going to, you know, it's pretty much, they're going to have to go past the bar, past the payday loans place, past Papa John's to get the children. Who would want to do that? And what I didn't know that whole time is that God was orchestrating something else. And I don't know if you guys know this, you may not know this. We have, uh, after this happened, uh, a guy from Dallas came down here and said, that's weird. Here, I'm gonna buy some land and give it to you guys. And it was $2 million worth of land. So if somebody would said to me, um, Chris, hey, here's the deal. In, a, in 2018, if you had said, hey, in like eight years or so, you're gonna have two churches and you're gonna have land free and clear in Brushy Creek. Uh, and it's gonna be a little weird, but that's the end result. I would be like, oh, well, that would, that's nice to know. That also takes zero faith. And here we are, walking by faith, trusting the Lord, following him, not an equation, not a force, not a, not a pull the lever and get land to fall from heaven, not pull the lever and money shows up, but trust in the Lord with all my heart. Lean not on his own understanding. Lean not on my own understanding. In all my ways, acknowledge him and he's gonna direct my path. That doesn't mean you're not gonna be sad. Remember, what did Job do? The very first thing, when he got the news that everyone's dead and like he lost everything, what did he do? He tore his robes. He started crying and grieving. This is, I don't want you to be a Christian stoic. That's how I'm looking like, hey, have, be a Christian. Just don't feel anything. That's, you've got counseling ahead of you in your future. Like that's not okay. But you need to kind of re- realize that God's got a specific plan and sadness sometimes is part of it. But that sadness ultimate turns to joy because we know all things work for the good of those who love him or called according to his purpose. And this is where I want you to see this. Watch. You see, Job you know, he hears it. Job answered the Lord and he said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Do you hear that? You can do all things and his purpose will not be thwarted. And then he said this, he quotes God. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? And he goes, well, okay, let me repent from the thing that, you know, you're right. Let me answer that for you. Therefore, I've uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful me, which I did not know. And remember, because God said, here, I want you to answer these questions. Here, and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I've heard of you by the hearing of your, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So here he says, I am wrong. You are right. I trust you. You've got a greater plan than I ever could. I'm just your servant. And what happened because of that, watch this, eventually, uh, four verses later, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job. Now watch this. I need, somebody needs to see it. When did he restore the fortunes of Job? When he had prayed for his friends. Which friends? The friends that were complete jerks in the dust. I think some of you here need to pray for your friends who have hurt you. Some of you need to pray for your family, your family who has hurt you because you are waiting for the fortune without the forgiveness. Okay, that's for free. We'll keep moving. All right, just kind of need to anchor on that for a sec. And then after that, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now look at this. So he prays for his friends. God restores him. And then it shows us how he restores him. This to me is awesome. It's not like God sent down like a magic, you know, I don't know, chest of gold. 
No, then came to him all his, uh, all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house and they showed him sympathy. The very thing that the three friends, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar should have been doing in the first place. They do it now. Oh, I'm so sorry. That must be so hard. Let's pray for you. How awesome. And then they follow up their prayers and their sympathy and they each of them gave a piece of money and a ring of gold. Do you see that? They didn't just have people being like, that's really nice. Let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya. No, they said, hey guys, empty out your pockets. We got to help our brother Joe. That's what Christians do when someone else is suffering. Do you guys know that? If, if that's weird to you, then you don't know what it is to be part of a church. We invite you to be part of our church. It's really awesome. It's an incredible experience, but it costs you something. But notice how like, like there wasn't like a, God had his gun to their head. You better pay up right now for Job. They, they saw him sacrifice for them and pray for them. And like, oh yeah, God knows Job. We love Job. We love God. We're gonna, and so they start the GoFundMe for Job. And the next thing you know, watch, Job with his, you know, starter fund, he gets kickstarted and the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. And here's the thing. Do you think the blessing was the money? If you think it was, you're clueless. Job found intimacy with God through his questioning. Do you see that? Job found intimacy with God through his questioning. And I love this part of the story. So that means, what that means is if you are suffering, if you are going through um, infertility, if you're going through uh, singleness and you're not wanting to be single, if you're wanting to be, if you're married and you don't, want to be married, this is for you. Like whatever the situation you're in, if you're, you're children, you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter and you're just like dying on the inside, run to God. I love Luke 18. It's one of my favorite, 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 favorite parts of the Bible. Luke 18, there's this uh, lady and she's a widow and she's like, goes to this judge, grant me justice against my adversary. And the judge is like, you're a nobody. I don't know who God is, so I don't care. And I don't care about justice. I just care about my paycheck. And how much do you have? Nothing. That's right. Keep it moving, little lady. And she's like, I ain't leaving. And she comes back again and again. And she gets, you know, she meets him on the way. And you know, he can't just like shoot her because that would look weird because uh, he wants to keep his job. And so he's just annoyed by her. And every time he like, you know, goes in the back way to work and she found that out. So she meets him there. I want justice. I want justice. You know, she's got her cane. She's whacking him on the, I don't know. Eventually, eventually she's like, or the, the judge is like, I don't care about God and I don't care about justice because I can get that woman to stop bothering me. I'm gonna make sure she gets justice. And then Jesus says, how much more will your heavenly father give justice to those who cry out to him? Meaning he's a dad and an unjust judge. You can't even compare, but somehow they get the same result. But it's the heart of a father who wants to bless his kids. Will you, but then this Jesus leads with this. But when the son of man comes, this is what Jesus said. When the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Meaning, do people have enough faith to come to God when their suffering is at its greatest, when everything seems unfair, because I'm a person, not a force. I'm a person who loves you like a dad, not some disconnected deity somewhere that needs to be roused from his heavenly slumber. And that's why we sing the songs. And that's why our heart explodes with joy because God is up to something, always. Now, um, this morning, I have a question for you and I wanna kind of let you sit on this. How will you respond to suffering? I told you a story when we first started here about uh, the soldier coming up to me and saying, you know, his best friend, Sergeant Gibbs, passed away. Uh, that night, uh, after he asked me, why is all this happening? And I, I went through like, you know, man, a lot of options, presidents, colonels, whatever. But I eventually go, listen, there's something wrong with the human condition. It's why people die. It's why people get cancer. It's why we go to war. And it's this thing called sin. It's infected every person on the planet. And Jesus came. He died on that cross for your sin. And he rose to the dead. And if you receive it, he'll make you a brand new person. And eventually, through tears, he came to accept Christ. And, and in that process, he said, but what if I start sinning again? I don't want to make God mad. He didn't say it like that, but that's the intent, he said. I don't want to make God mad with my sin. In other words, he went back to moralism. I said, listen, the gospel isn't about making bad people better. It's about making dead people alive. And if you come to faith in him, he'll change you from the inside out. Now, watch this. He comes to faith. It's awesome. Great story. Hooray. Yay, Jesus. Now, 
I get back to the States, as one would, and I'm, you know, in, in, I'm at seminary. I, I left the military to go to the ministry. I'm in seminary. And while I was in seminary, I would get asked to go speak at different things. And sometimes I'd speak in front of like 100,000 people, like it's amazing. And sometimes I'd speak to 20, like when you, when you don't really get much choice when you're in seminary. It's kind of like wherever anyone will have you talk. And so I get to this little uh, youth group in Oklahoma. There's like 20, 25 kids. And I remember thinking, well, all right. You know, here I am, 20, 25 kids. And I start telling war stories. I start talking about Sergeant Gibbs and him dying and Sergeant Kishbaugh coming to Christ. And, and that story is part of it. And then we, you know, we go play gaga ball and then kickball. And then a lot of things, was, it was exhausting, okay? Like when it's 25 kids and you're the speaker, you're all in, all right? That's the way that works. And after, uh, after that day, I had this teenage girl come up to me and I'll never forget, Adrian was with me at this time. And uh, she goes, uh, my last name is Gibbs. You were talking about my dad. And she goes, for the longest time, I always wondered what happened. Why I was asking God so long, why? Why would you allow my dad? And so she was a teenager then, so she must be like, you know, nine or 10 at the time, whenever, whenever he had passed. And so I was wondering what happened. To know that his death led to the salvation of another, it just all of a sudden, it felt like God answered my prayer. All the whys came together. Now listen, 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 listen. There's something happened in the cosmic realm that you don't understand. That's why you're here today. Not all your stories, not all your answers are gonna come right in the midst of the suffering, but you will get them, I promise you will. In fact, the Bible says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who gives generous to all without finding fault, it will be given to him. And that comes on the heels of, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of any kind, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so it may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if you don't know why it's going on, ask, come to God. Intimacy is on the other side. How will you respond to suffering? Come closer to Christ. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. That's the promise. If you're a Christian, no, no, listen, if you're a Christian, the Bible says, James 4, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. You are as close to God as you choose to be. Cry out to him. So this morning, as we go into the Lord's Supper, if you're a Christian, this is gonna be a sweet time for you. Whatever suffering you're bringing, you're gonna bring it right to the cross, right in the middle of this sort of suffering and moment. I want you to sort of like the struggle, the parts where you're doubting God, I want you to bring it to him. Okay, hold on. But if you're not a Christian, you don't have those promises. All things don't work together for good because you're not called according to his purpose and love. And so this morning, I'm pleading with you because this is what I do. I, I'm urging you in view of God's mercy, be reconciled to God. Don't let a moment go by where you don't have a relationship with. Otherwise, every suffering will have no answer. Every suffering will lead to a big question mark. Every struggle, every pain goes into this blade, great abyss of why and it does not have an answer. But for those who are in Christ, there is joy. Yes. Yes. So I want to pray for you this morning. And if you're not a a follower of Christ, today might be your day. And if you're like not sure, text Jesus, come find me. Let's take the next step together because I want you to make decisions for Christ because suffering's coming and I want you to be ready. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your grace. You do all things well, you never fail. Your love is new every single day. And so God, as we proclaim your goodness, as we proclaim your truth, as we proclaim your grace. God, would you do an unbelievable, awesome work in somebody this morning that they might go from death to life. And as we take the Lord's Supper, Lord, would you just remind us of that? Lord, would you fill us with your spirit as we trust wholly in you? Lord, would somebody turn to you for maybe the first time or the hundredth time to be reminded that they come running to you because you are the God of grace. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.